Hey everyone, it's been a while. I wanted to thank everyone who messaged me in the last couple of years, encouraging me to make more videos, to come back to YouTube. Um, your messages were in fact a big reason why I decided to come back to YouTube, so thank you. Uh, I can't yet commit to a regular upload schedule, but I can tell you that I have a long list I've been keeping of videos I really want to make, so, you know, that bodes well. Um, for today's video, I wanted to share with you guys one of my favorite letters in the history of science and try to explain why I love it so much. It was written by Charles Darwin in 1860 to one of his critics. So the year before, Darwin had just published his great magnum opus on the origin of species, in which he lays out his case for evolution by natural selection. Um, it was a controversial book, as you might imagine, because, you know, it not only lays out this grand theory, uh, but that theory is a huge challenge to the prevailing view of humans as separate from and above the animal kingdom. So it got a lot of pushback, as Darwin knew it would, um, but even though he had been expecting criticism, he was still just so galled by the quality of a lot of the criticism. You know, people would straw man him, misrepresent his arguments, uh, ignore the nuances in his arguments and evidence, basically like Twitter. So, you know, frustrating. And Darwin would fume in private about this. But there was one exception, one critic, a Swiss zoologist named Francois Jules Pictet de la Rive, who wrote a critical review of On the Origin of Species, uh, critical in the sense that it disagreed with the book, but Darwin loved the review so much that he wrote Pictet de la Rive essentially a thank you note, telling him how much he appreciated the review. And that is the letter that I'm going to read to you. I've shortened it very slightly, but it's basically as written by Darwin to Pictet de la Rive in 1860. He says, Dear Sir, I received this morning your review and have just read it. I thank you most cordially for it. There have been many reviews in England opposed to me, but yours is the single one which seems to me perfectly fair and just and candid. I literally agree to every word you say. I admit there are no direct proofs of the greater modifications which I believe in. I most fully admit that I by no means explain away all the vast difficulties. The only difference between us is that I attach much more weight to the explanation of facts and somewhat less weight to the difficulties than you do. The first part of your review gives a really quite admirable condensation of my views. Allow me again to express to you my cordial thanks. I never thought that I should read an opposed review perfectly fair and just. I shall send it to Lyle, Hooker, and Huxley to read. With sincere respect, I remain yours very faithfully, C. Darwin. So why do I love this so much? You know, it's not just that Darwin is being gracious to a critic, although that is lovely. It's more than that. It's that he's demonstrating that what matters to him is not that someone agrees with his conclusions, but that, that they engage with his ideas in a fair and reasonable way. You know, that, that is what makes someone an ally to Darwin. So I love that, and I find Darwin's sincere joy in encountering good disagreement to be just so endearing. Um, also, by the way, it's worth noting that the letter contains a nice example of what fair and reasonable disagreement entails, which is be able to summarize the other person's view accurately enough that they read your summary and they go, yes, thank you, that is what I was trying to say. Or as Darwin put it, that is a really quite admirable condensation of my view. So, you know, Kudos to Pictet de la Rive. Um, I guess I should explain what Pictet de la Rive's main disagreement with the book was. Basically, he felt that natural selection couldn't account for large changes over time, uh, changes big enough to produce entirely new groups of species from old ones. He did think that it could account for changes over time within a species, like, well, like changes to a finch's beak. Um, but he just felt that Producing whole new groups of species was a much stronger claim and one that, you know, Darwin didn't have sufficient evidence to justify. And Darwin's response to this is basically, you're right, I don't have direct or conclusive proof of, of what we now call macroevolution. And I love this too, because, you know, even when you're right about something, your case is almost never going to be 100% airtight. There are usually going to be some 
uh, leaps that you have to make, some places where you have to say, you know, this is what seems most plausible to me, but I can't prove it. And most people don't do that. They either gloss over the weaknesses or, you know, deny that they're weak, and, and Darwin doesn't. Um, by the way, Darwin's explanation for why he didn't have direct proof of uh, macroevolution is just that the fossil record was incomplete. And this is true, you know. It's true now, it was even truer in Darwin's time. So he was right about that, but he didn't exaggerate the strength of the evidence uh, for his case at the time. Um, there's one more letter from Darwin to Piquet de la Rive that makes kind of a similar point. Uh, so I wanted to read to you a paragraph from that as well. Uh, he says, I am far from surprised that you go with me a very short way. I remember how slowly I changed my own opinion. And even supposing for the moment that my views were in the main right, I do not think anyone could at once undergo so great a revolution in opinion. So here he's basically saying, you know, I think I'm right, but I can step outside my own perspective and look at the evidence as it would appear to someone who's smart and reasonable, but not me. And I can see that, you know, uh, it, it's not going to be obvious that I'm right, even if I am. Um, and just as with the last letter, someone who hasn't seen all the evidence I have, who hasn't spent as much time thinking about this as I have, um, or in the case of the last letter, someone who just has different priors or who puts more weight on you know, the gaps in the theory than on the explanatory power of the theory, uh, they can come away with a different intuition about how plausible it is or how convincing the explanation is. And that doesn't necessarily mean that anyone is being you know, stupid or unreasonable. So I love that too. Um, I just think that Darwin is, <laughs> it's weird to say underrated <laughs> because he's like one of the most highly rated scientists in the history of science. But I do think that he's underrated not for his brilliance or his significance to science, but for his intellectual honesty. Because it really shines through in letters like these, um, in his autobiography, and even in On the Origin of Species itself, the way he talks about uh, the evidence and how his theory evolved over time, and the way he explicitly points at and, and talks about the you know, gaps in his theory and what it can't explain. Um, so I just, I would love to see Darwin get more recognition specifically for his intellectual honesty. Um, I will link in the description to this video uh, to both of the letters I read to you from today. And if you like this video, you should consider subscribing. And maybe also check out my podcast. It's called Rationally Speaking. And I'll put a link to that in the description as well. That's all for today. I'll see you guys next time.